I'm very humbled to be here. Uh, the Executive Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Sanwolu, represented by the Director of Public Affairs, Ministry of Information and Strategy, Mr. Adeshe Ogundeji. Adeshe Ogundeji, thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the media here present, my senior colleagues, my contemporaries, those coming very closely behind, and of course, my colleagues from ID Africa, BHM, and Placard. The President and Chairman of the Council, NIPR, Dr. Ike Neliaku, represented by Mr. Temitokwe Adaramola, his Deputy, Professor Emmanuel Dandara, Registrar, Mr. Uzoma Onyegbadwe, all council members of our Great Institute, the Chairman of Lagos State NIPR, Mrs. Comfort Nwankwo, Chairman of the Organizing Committee, Mrs. Bola Ogunola, who most might not know is my elder sister. <laughs> the entire fellows, EXCO, and members of NIPR and PRCAN here present. Please allow me to single out the present of PRCAN, my friend and brother, Mr. Israel Jaye Opayemi. <laughs> Our leader and fellow, Mrs. Nkechi Ali Balogun. Mr. Bolaji Abimbola from Indigo, and so many others I can see in the room. It's a privilege to stand before you here today. The last time I had the opportunity to meet with Lagos NIPR, it was, I recall, in 2020. I was invited, I think, by this great chapter to provide some context to the data in Nigeria PR report, which at the time was to use the then chairman, Mr. Shegun Makmeda's words, causing a bit of excitement in the industry. It was a good conversation, and I'm happy to tell you today that that report continues to be published, and it's now been expanded from just being a Nigeria report to covering 29 countries across Africa. It is the only report of its kind, and I'm proud to say that that report originated from Nigeria, from BHM, with incredible support from a lot of PR car member agencies, NIPR members, well-meaning media practitioners, and members of the academia. We've received praise from all over the world, and all of us here in this room today can take credit for that. Thank you. I must also say that since the last time I had the opportunity to meet with you, we've been privileged to kickstart a couple of other initiatives which tie into our mission to develop not only our organization and the Nigerian industry, but to help the industry across Africa take a suitable role in the global scheme of things. World PR Day, which we conceived in 2020, is now being celebrated every year on the 16th of July around the world. This year, we had almost 20,000 participants from 63 countries, over 200% increase from year one. There is still a long way to go, but I'm proud that we can stand here today bearing witness that initiatives like these are originating from our country and from our continent. The company I run, BHM, was founded in a very interesting way. I had a journalism career, which I didn't plan to have, because in university, all I wanted to do was go back to music promotion. That was my first love. But I found interest in writing, so I told myself that after school, it would be good to have an opportunity to build and share knowledge. Of course, I settled for music reporting, and it was fun. I had an opportunity, thanks to Mr. Azua Rinze and Mr. Kunle Bakari, for giving me a platform at Encomio, and to Moses Jola Emian and Mr. Obong Okon Ekong for giving me a platform at this stage. And of course, Steve Ayerinde and others at the punch, who also gave me a platform at the punch. I had the opportunity to practice journalism in my own way. Lacking a journalism or mass comm background, I had in my head this very stubborn idea of what could pass as news and how to combine celebrity journalism with art journalism. Everywhere I went, my editors and publishers let me do my thing, and I think I did a fairly good job. But I wasn't making money, and I was restless. And I kept getting requests from musicians and actors to support them in their careers through writing profiles and preparing EPKs and everything. 
Then my friend, God bless his soul, Sam Sultan, wanted me to be his manager. You see, Sam Sultan and his brother, Baba D, were old friends, and I recall them taking me to their labor boss at the time, Keke Ogunwe, saying, we want Ayani to be our manager. He knows the media, he knows the people, he knows the industry. He actually came into journalism from the music industry, so he knows the space. But Keke did not agree. He said to us, all three of us, that Ayani should be your publicist, not your manager. Then he turned to me and said, go and find out what it takes. And if you like it, I will give you your first brief. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why I'm here today. I started with this story to let you know that everything I've done, from when I was born to when I was a kid, to university, to journalism, and running my own business today, is because I've had the opportunity to apply innovation, to be naive, to be stupid a lot of times, to be crazy and creative, and to have the opportunity, the courage, and the privilege to do things differently. At times out of fear, at times out of curiosity, at times out of innocent ignorance, and oftentimes because I just had no choice. But we're here today, and I'm grateful that I can tell you that we've built what is considered one of the most successful public relations and communications consultancies in this part of the world, by billing, by revenue, by thought leadership, and by client category. We are a top five firm in Nigeria, and we're, com and we're comfortably sitting at the top 10 across the continent. We're a proud Nigerian company that was founded by this skinny, very good, skinny, stammering, scared, third class graduate standing in front of you today, almost 17 years ago. But how did we do it? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stammer. But how did we do it? What lessons have we learned? What does tomorrow look like? And what do we need to do next? I'm going to tie that with the theme of my keynote, which has to do with innovation and creativity and the future of our practice. And I'm going to add one more layer on the back of that, because BHM does not stand on its own. It doesn't exist for its own sake. Public relations and communications does not stand on its own, nor does it exist for its own sake. We are doing this for humanity, for democracy, for nations and countries and organizations. So whatever we discuss here today, it is my fervent wish that it will tie back to how we can make humanity better, how we can help mankind, how we can help ni fix Nigeria by playing our own role, and how eventually every living being on the surface of the earth can understand the power of ethical communication and why we should all be communicators. So when we think of public relations, tell me, what comes to mind? I realize that oftentimes we think about classroom textbooks, we think about agencies like Chain Reactions and BHM and CMC Connect and Mediacraft and Indigo and LSFPR and so on and so forth. We think about ministries and departments in government. We think about so many things. When we think about reputation management, what comes to mind? Most of us here in this room today, we think about consultants and advisors and client service people. We think about this day and Guardian and Arise and Tribune and Channels. When we think about our practice, we still think about what it was originally designed to be, what it was designed to do, how it was originally formed. I find that oftentimes it's easy to forget about the age we live in, the society we currently live in, and the reality of our time. We forget to think that, let's bring it home to Nigeria, actually. You're talking about communicating in an environment where 74.1% of the population is under 25 years of age. An environment where education has continuously depreciated. An environment where, when the first set of peer practitioners were admitted in this country, there were no mobile phones or laptops or internet connectivity. The World Wide Web did not exist, not to mention all the great inventions built on the back of that infrastructure. Today, almost all of us in this room have at least one mobile phone with us. Almost all of those phones have internet connectivity. You either have a MIFA in your pocket, or you subscribe to a mobile data plan, which I hope is NTN, by the way. We almost always think of public relations and reputation management from a theoretical point of view from a limited scope of practice experience, whereas we could benefit from adding from and demonstrating an understanding of the sociology of today's world, 
the psychology of individual and group humans today and agenda, policies, and techniques pulling it all together. I think we've done a great job of the past. We are not doing horribly in the present, but, and that is a big but, if we will perform excellently in the coming future, I'd like us to leave here today with a total overhaul of how we picture and practice public relations and communications for today and for tomorrow. I'll explain. When you look at the leaders on YouTube and TikTok, we call them influencers. The thought leaders, the trendsetters, the advocates, you know, you will struggle to find people in my profession, PR people there. When you go to Instagram, it's the same thing, we're struggling. When you go to Facebook, it's the same thing. Switch on your TV, radio, or flip the pages of newspapers. The people shaping thoughts, setting agenda, they are mostly not PR people. What I find is that we continue to perfect the theory and the traditional aspect of what our profession requires. But behaviors have changed significantly. Habits have changed. Society has changed. The world's population was only 2 billion in 1928 when Edward Bernays published the definitive PR journal, Propaganda. There are maybe 7 billion of us humans on Earth today. Bernays and his colleagues deployed public relations to support the American war effort. I'll quote a paragraph from his book that will provide a good anchor for our debate. This is from Edward Bernays' book. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, and our ideas suggested, largely by men and women we have never heard of. It is they who pull the wires that control the public mind. It's, it's almost one century later, the entire world is in conflict, democracy is in danger, Wars are tearing down continents. Companies and governments are behaving badly. We're lost. The world we know is changing dangerously right under our noses, and I doubt we can even see or smell it. Do you know what I think? The world is losing a lot by the PR industry not being deliberate about being behind these changes that we see. The world is losing too much when the custodians and gatekeepers of trust, honesty, and ethical communications are not the drivers of the national and global actions and narratives that we are witnessing, of foreign policies and organizational priorities and citizen actions. We, the people in PR, lose influence and revenue and opportunity if we are not doing this. But the world loses more, far more, if we are not aggressively merging our theoretical knowledge, field expertise, and professional training with current trends in international relations, diplomacy, technology, sustainability, and, and all else, in guiding our principals, our clients, and partners to not only do what is right morally, legally, and ethically, but to also communicate the same in order to achieve positive impact. But we cannot give what we do not have. We must not attempt to fix this issue without going back to the foundation. So it starts with how we are trained. In a meeting just a few weeks ago with a member of faculty from Pan Atlantic University, we discussed an opportunity for a BHM and PAU intervention. And I said to them, we are facing today what the banks faced in the maybe 90s and early 2000s. If you recall, the banks will hire anybody, mostly engineers and lawyers and doctors, and they will spend a year retraining them on banking and finance and sales and marketing. Almost every bank had its own training school. I'm saying today that the trouble that PR faces is that the quality of talents that are being churned out from the academic institutions is not necessarily bad, but they are not exactly what the doctor recommended. Unfortunately, departments, ministries, and agencies are too small, too poorly funded to be able to embark on the kind of extensive training like the banks will normally do for their new hires. So what do we do? We need to talk about ongoing learning and development. If you ask me about innovation, which is why we're here today, my wish would be for us to approach it from this prison, 
how do we first innovate our practice? How do we innovate the teaching of the subject of public relations? You see, oftentimes we talk about artificial intelligence. We have all these buzzwords. We talk about machine learning. We talk about all sorts of things. And I'm like, guys, can we just calm down? We need to go back to the basics, to measurement, to the actual art of consulting. We need to start from there. We need to get the basics right and make sure the fundamentals are in place. Therein lies what we can build on. The innovation that I long for, that I test for in PR, it is my wish that it will start from the way the profession is being taught in colleges and universities. I know this problem is not peculiar to PR only, but we are here today in this room as PR professionals discussing the past, present, and future of our great profession. This is the most influential chapter of NIPR in Nigeria. I dare say this is one of the most influential chapters of a PR body across the continent. And guys, I've seen the CIPR, I'm a member of PRSA, I've worked with the PRCA, I see how they work, and I dare say, we are gathered here in this room today with what I've seen from the speeches I've listened to, the quality of talent in this room, gathered here today may as well be one of the most influential, one of the most significant chapters of a PR association anywhere in the world. This means that we have an opportunity to drive the change that we need. We have an opportunity to drive the innovation that we speak of, not only for Nigeria, but for the entire Africa and the rest of the world. But let's hold on. Why is it important for PR to innovate to be successful? Why do we need to actually plan for the future? The theme of this session, why should it be important to you and I? Well, because our country still has a terrible reputation out there. Nigeria, one of the greatest countries on Earth, one of the most gifted nations on planet Earth with incomparable natural and human resources, the country that gave the world the hottest pop music right now, one of the top three biggest Nollywood industries in the film industries in the world, the country of Ankara, the country of Pestak and Jollof Rice, the country of Adire, of Chimamanda, of Wole Shoyinka, and so on and so forth. Yet, she is still regularly seen almost everywhere you go as a country of Yahweh Yahu, as a country of crime, as a country that is often described, if you were to quote that former US president, as a shithole. Why do we need to innovate, ladies and gentlemen? Because our practice, despite all the work that we do and the promise that we have, is still being seen as inferior to similar practices in management consulting. Clients, organizations, and governments are willing to compensate 10 times more Agencies like Deloitte, McKinsey, Ernst & Young, Bank Consulting, and so on, more than they will pay a comparable PR agency. How does an industry that purports to help the world build its own reputation have such a bad reputation? Why do we need to innovate? Well, because governments need it too. Government after government, you can see the impact of failed public relations and reputation management on not just that government, but on the state of our democracy on the state and on the citizenship. You've seen fake news, terrible spin, false propaganda hijack government communications machinery, and we've seen the result of that. Right now, we have a new government in power that has a strong reputation problem, and you've seen the effect of that. We have an opportunity to help. It's in our individual and collective interest for every government, including this government, to succeed, whether we approve of who is in office or not. So why do we need to innovate, ladies and gentlemen? We need to innovate because the world is counting on us to provide guidance, to provide counsel, to show the way and lead if we are to have a world without war, a world without disease, a world without crime. It looks like it's impossible, guys. But my training and my understanding of PR are about honesty and truth and stakeholder management. And just working with stakeholders and principals to uphold ethical behavior and governance to build trust across borders. That's how you prevent the kind of senseless wars we are witnessing everywhere. How you prevent the anti-science conspiracies and even the citizen rebellion against governments across Africa and elsewhere. Now, if we are not at the table, if we don't innovate, if we don't earn respect, if our reputation does not lead organizations and governments to think, I need to turn to this industry to transform how I am perceived, how I am seen, 
I need to turn to this industry to get the right counsel on how I must act. I need to consider this industry if I were to win with the electorate, if I were to win with my board, if I were to win with my employees, if I were to win with my communities. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, we need to innovate. Meaning that we cannot afford to be stuck in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s. In fact, we cannot afford to be stuck in 2023. As we stand here today at the Mission Center on Thursday, September 21, 2023, the technologies of the future are already being tested and piloted. As we sit here today, behaviors are changing per second. Most of us here today would have young children who cannot imagine a world without mobile phones and the internet. Most of us here today are familiar with Google Maps and OpenAI. And for want of a better word, and um, the, the gentleman earlier beat me to it, to it, the internet of things. If you're not already familiar with augmented reality and artificial intelligence, I'm sorry, you're already too late. So imagine the next 20 years, the year 2043, where would our profession be? Would we be here discussing our chartered status? Strategizing about how clients could better compensate us? Would we be here discussing the quality of the talent that we attract, comparing notes about all these things that are sort of collaborating to hold us back? Or would we be celebrating a hundred years and more of this great profession with our own Nobel laureate and political winners and president and Fortune 500 CEOs in the room? Because one day, in 2023, we all agreed to roll up our sleeves, put our heads together, go back to the basics, and build the future. If we go back to the basics, the beneficiaries will be you and I in this room today. All two, three, four, five hundred of us. But guess what? The beneficiaries would also be almost everyone not in this room today. Talk about seven billion people around the world. In rounding up, our work has a significant impact on every industry and every sector that you look at, be it medicine, be it law, be it politics. We are the conscience of these organizations and practices. We are the counselors, we are the stakeholder managers, we are the reputation managers, we are the ones who should be there holding presidents by the hand, holding others and chiefs and CEOs, guiding them towards the path that will not only help them do the right thing, but that will help their stakeholders understand that they are indeed doing the right thing. I long for the time when we can play that role. That's why we need to innovate. But how? I think that's something I would like to touch on before I leave you here today. Because, you see, we can dialogue and discuss and live here and still not understand the problem. In fact, I often find that it's not that people do not often know the problem, but we struggle with the how. How do we innovate? How? Hold on, and please give me your undivided attention. I beg you, stop what you're doing, just for a few minutes. Because I want to put the answer right there on the screen. It's an expo. All right, I lied. It's not an answer. It's a video I found, which is going to be played now, whoever is in charge. It's a video I found, which I want us all to watch together, if the lights can go off. It's about another hugely important industry, education. This video won't give us the answer we are looking for, or maybe it will, but I'm certain it will get us all thinking. Thank you. Can we play the video, please? Albert Einstein once said, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Today on trial, we have modern day schooling. Glad you could come. Not only does he make fish climb trees, but also makes them climb down and do a 10 mile run. Tell me school, are you proud of the things you've done? Turning millions of people into robots, do you find that fun? Do you realize how many kids relate to that fish swimming upstream in class, never finding their gifts, thinking they are stupid, believing they are useless? Well, the time has come, no more excuses. I call school to the stand and accuse him of killing creativity, individuality, and being intellectually abusive. He's an ancient institution that has outlived his usage. So, Your Honor, this concludes my opening statement, and if I may present the evidence of my case, I will prove it. Proceed. Exhibit A, 
Here's a modern day phone. Recognize it? Here's a phone from 150 years ago. Big difference, right? Stay with me. Here's a car from today. And here's a car from 150 years ago. Big difference, right? Well, get this. Here's a classroom of today. And here's a class we used 150 years ago. Now ain't that a shame? In literally more than a century, nothing has changed. Yet you claim to prepare students for the future? But with evidence like that, I must ask, do you prepare students for the future or the past? I did a background check on you and let the record show that you were made to train people to work in factories, which explains why you put students in straight rows, nice and neat, tell them sit still, raise your hand if you want to speak, give them a short break to eat, and for eight hours a day, tell them what to think. Oh, and make them compete to get an A, a letter which determines product quality, hence grade A of meat. I get it. Back then, times were different. We all have a past. I myself am no Gandhi. But today, we don't need to make robot zombies. The world has progressed. And now we need people who think creatively, innovatively, critically, independently with the ability to connect. See, every scientist will tell you that no two brains are the same. And every parent with two or more children will confirm that claim. So please explain why you treat students like cookie cutter frames or snapback hats giving them this one-size-fits-all crap. Watch your language. Sorry, Your Honor, but if a doctor prescribed the exact same medicine to all of his patients, the results would be tragic. So many people would get sick, yet when it comes to school, this is exactly what happens, this educational malpractice where one teacher stands in front of 20 kids, each one having different strengths, different needs, different gifts, different dreams, and you teach the same thing the same way? That's horrific. Ladies and gentlemen, the defendant should not be acquitted. This may be one of the worst criminal offenses ever to be committed. And let's mention the way you treat your employees. Objection. Overruled. I want to hear this. It's a shame. I mean, teachers have the most important job on the planet, yet they're underpaid? No wonder so many students are short-changed. Let's be honest. Teachers should earn just as much as doctors because a doctor can do heart surgery and save the life of a kid but a great teacher can reach the heart of that kid and allow him to truly live. See, teachers are heroes that often get blamed, but they're not the problem. They work in a system without many options or rights. Curriculums are created by policymakers, most of which have never taught a day in their life. Just obsessed with standardized tests, they think bubbling in a multiple choice question will determine success. That's outlandish. In fact, these tests are too crude to be used and should be abandoned, but don't take my word for it. Take Frederick J. Kelly, the man who invented standardized testing, who said, and I quote, these tests are too crude to be used and should be abandoned. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if we continue down this road, the results will be lethal. I don't have much faith in school, but I do have faith in people. And if we can customize health care, cars, and Facebook pages, then it is our duty to do the same for education, to upgrade it, change it, do away with school spirit, because that's useless. Unless we're working to bring the spirit out of each and every student, that should be our task. No more common core. Instead, let's reach the core of every heart in every class. Sure, math is important, but no more than art or dance. Let's give every gift an equal chance. I know this sounds like a dream, but countries like Finland are doing impressive things. They have shorter school days. Teachers make a decent wage. Homework is non-existent, and they focus on collaboration instead of competition. But here's the kicker, boys and girls. Their educational system outperforms every other country in the world. Other places like Singapore are succeeding rapidly. Schools like Montessori, programs like Khan Academy, there is no single solution. But let's get moving. Because while students may be 20% of our population, they are 100% of our future. So let's attend to their dreams. And there's no telling what we can achieve. This is a world in which I believe. A world where fish are no longer forced to climb trees. I rest my case. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the session.